had a college basketball game that felt like a heavyweight championship fight. The kid from French Lick, Indiana, playing against this kid who came out with a big time reputation, Urban Magic Johnson. If you wrote this, if you, if you scripted it, and then tried to make it a movie, people would say, eh, it was too cliche. I did not like Larry Bird, he didn't like me. I knew it was gonna be a dog fight. It's like oh, two old gunslingers saying, meet me out front. He's at the bird. Bird score! I knew right away we was in for a tough game. They had a lot of talent. Here it comes. The alley oop to Greg Kelser. I think that was a seminal game. It brought a lot of non-college fans to the game. It was huge then. It is bigger now in retrospect. We all knew something was happening that we'd be talking about years later, which we are. Hello, I'm Gary Miller, and welcome to Classic Big Ticket, the 1979 NCAA championship game between Indiana State and Michigan State, Magic versus Bird. This showdown between Larry Bird's Sycamores and Magic Johnson's Spartans remains the highest rated college basketball game in history. We're pleased to be joined by this game's two coaches. In his first of four seasons as head coach at Indiana State, he led the Sycamores to an undefeated regular season and the Final Four. He was the 1979 AP and UPI Coach of the Year. He is currently out of coaching, teaching social studies at a middle school in Georgia, where he joins us now. Bill Hodges, thanks for joining us on Classic Big Ticket. Thank you very much for having me. In addition to Bill, We've also got Judd Heathcote. He guided the Spartans to the 1979 national title. He led the Spartans to three Big Ten titles. He won 340 games in East Lansing, all while sporting various shades of green. Judd Heathcote, welcome to our show on Classic Big Ticket. Nice to be with you, Gary. Nice to be with you, Bill. And he's got green on again today, folks. Well, let's start with you, Bill. We mentioned this was your first season running the Sycamores. Tell us about the unfortunate circumstances when you took over this program. You'd been an assistant. The head coach, Bob King, had a heart attack in the offseason and then had a brain aneurysm four days before practice. How did you adjust? Well, Bob had had the heart attack, and we expected him back for practice. He had uh, a brain aneurysm. They had to go in and, and do surgery. And he made it back to some of the games later in the season, but uh, he never could coach again. You took over a team, Bill, four days before practice, but how much easier did it make it being a team that had Larry Bird? Well, you know, they had chosen us as, uh, and also ran in our conference. I think uh, they picked us like fourth. Uh, so I don't think there was a lot of pressure. Larry is so easy to coach. You know, he's gonna come every day to practice and, and he's gonna give everything he's got. And when your best player does that, everybody else is gonna follow along. Judd, over in East Lansing, you had a guy that was pretty magical of his own, Irvin Johnson. You were the defending Big Ten champs. He was just a sophomore. But at one point during this season, you were just 5-4 and four in the conference. You'd been blown out by Northwestern, of all people. What happened at that point to turn this season around? Well, everyone uh, attributes a team meeting where, uh, you know, if you talk to people, I think there were at least 10,000 people at that team meeting. <laughs> But what really came out of that meeting was the fact that the coaches in our league had figured out what we did on the fast break. So we changed the starting lineup. Now we had a three guard lineup. Suddenly we have a fast break again. Uh, we reel off 10 straight wins and uh, I'm not saying we waltzed to the NCAA title, but this made us a different kind of team and a much more effective team in terms of what Magic could do to help all the other players. Let's take a look at your road to the Final Four, which got you this championship game against Indiana State. The Spartans opened the tournament play with easy wins over Lamar and LSU, and then you knocked off the big one. A lot of people felt like maybe this was the national championship game. Tell me a little bit about that game against the Fighting Irish, who were the top seed in your region. Notre Dame had that Sunday package, so they were on every single week, and our players were tired of seeing them on TV, getting all the publicity that they got, and so, uh, you know, we, uh, we played very well, but they had five starters that all had great professional careers. So, you know, you can argue, and certainly Bill isn't gonna say that, because hey, he had Indiana State, but that could well have been uh, the second best team in the country uh, Notre Dame at that time. 
Uh, let's take a look now at Indiana State's road. Virginia Tech, then Oklahoma, then a miracle last second shot to knock off Arkansas. And they held off DePaul. Larry Bird explodes in that DePaul game. 35 points, 16 rebounds, 9 assists. Despite that unbeaten mark, though, Bill, you guys didn't move up to number one until right before the tournament. When do you feel your team finally got some recognition? Uh, UCLA had been number one for a number of weeks, and we were second. And UCLA lost, and they jumped Notre Dame over us. And, uh, you know, I remember the newspaper people calling and asking if I wasn't upset about that. I said, you know, it really doesn't matter. You know, as we play for our championship, we're not like football where we have to <laughs> depend on the polls. The year before, we were maybe better than we were that year. Uh, Larry's senior year, we were uh, definitely deeper, but uh, we didn't get in the tournament because we couldn't win our conference championship. Well, how did you keep your composure? I mean, here you're a coach that just gets the head job four days before the season, that school had never been in the NCAAs. How did you stay calm and keep your kids calm? Ignorance. We didn't know better. <laughs> yeah. I'll certainly buy that. I know, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, I'm going to get back at you now. In preparing for this final, you had Magic Johnson practice as Larry Bird. Now, Magic sat down for ESPN Classic, and he recalled that assignment. I was Larry Bird on the scout team. His judge came over to me, got a no judge. E? He called me E. Look here. We want you, you know, judge does this a lot. We want you to be on the scout team. I want you to play Larry Bird. Every time you touch it, shoot it. Boy, you should have seen me. I thought I was Larry Bird that day. Oh, man. I didn't miss but two shots. My teammates were so mad at me because Judd was just screaming at him. How can we win if you don't guard him? That's Larry Bird. Get on him. And. And so Greg Kelso grabbed me, quit making us look bad. <laughs> I said, I can't help it, I'm hot. <laughs> Judd, was his impression better of Larry Bird or of you? You know, I still remember that. And, uh, you know, that's the time we were inundated with media for the first time in the Final Four. And so they want to make a mountain out of the fact that Magic, in his last practice of his uh, maybe season, maybe career, has to play on the second team. And he just laughed at him and said, that's how we got ready. But he did. He had a ball. He was making fun of the starters. He was throwing <laughs> things over his head and they were going in. And we did it mainly not for the shooting as much as for the passing. And we had the van advantage, I think, and I said this all along, we had two superstars. They had one. Gregory Kelzer uh, was a very, very good college player. Even he uh, as Magic said, was getting exasperated with Magic and how much fun he was having at their expense. Well, Bill, as Judd just mentioned, the media was unprecedented for that time. This game was a dream matchup on so many levels. It was city against country, flash against substance, of course, Magic, Bird. How big did you feel the media frenzy was leading up to this game? You know, that, it was so distracting. At the Final Four, uh, we had to go to meetings and weren't allowed to be with our kids as much as uh, I normally was with them. Uh, you know, I was with the team all the time, but when we got to the Final Four, we, we didn't uh, do that, and I think that probably hurt our kids. It, it hurt our concentration, I believe. You talk about how big the game was in the public's eyes, and Bill will uh, attest to this. When we get there, the media is immediately talking about Michigan State and Indiana State, they don't want to talk about Indiana State and DePaul. They don't want to talk about Michigan State and Penn. From the day we get there, it's the Birdman against the Magic Man. And, you know, they wrote all those things prior to the semifinal games. And I think that's what captivated the entire country was a matchup between those two superstars. Well, guys, thanks for setting the table. In fact, we've got a little piece coming up that's going to talk about some of that as well. We'll see you both as this historic matchup unfolds. When we return, we're going to tip off the 1979 NCAA championship game between Michigan State and Indiana State. Magic versus Bird here on Classic Big Ticket. Welcome back to Classic Big Ticket. I'm Gary Miller. The 1979 NCAA championship game helped raise college basketball's tournament from an annual event into that phenomenon known as March Madness. Here's Sports Century's Chris Fowler with more on this dream matchup. 
At the end of the 1970s, college basketball was still in recovery from several crippling point-shaving scandals dating back to the 50s. College basketball was not a national sport, and the networks didn't cover the Final Four or the final game uh, the way they would later. There was not the hype, there was not the media attention, there was not the newspaper attention. Aided by forward Greg Kelser, Magic led the Spartans into the Final Four. If the nation took interest, the Michigan State student body was a quiver with joy. Meanwhile, across the southern state line, Larry Bird's Sycamores of Indiana State savored their unbeaten season. We were totally shocked. I mean, we'd watched them all year long coming along, and we kind of thought, you know, well, as soon as they get to the tournament, then we'll find out the real thing, and then somehow they just kept winning. Michigan State wasn't a drop kick then either. I mean, back then it was believed that Magic was great, but oh, he couldn't shoot. And so it, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that we'd see Magic and, and Larry in the final. And then the unlikely occurred. Magic and Bird would meet for the national title. Their differences were striking. When Larry Bird played against Magic Johnson uh, in the 1979 NCAA Finals, you would have thought that there couldn't be two people less alike in the world. I did not like Larry Bird, he didn't like me, because we were both going after the same thing. I wanted to be the best, and he wanted to be the best. So it's like two old gunslingers saying, meet me out front. And you know, only one could survive. All of a sudden, you had a, a college basketball game that felt like a heavyweight championship fight. This thing picked up momentum, picked up momentum, and, and here you had this jazzy kid from East Lansing and, and, and the hick from French Lake, and, and one kid with a team of four players that you knew wouldn't be able to get a pickup game as soon as the tournament was over. And then this, this team that, that had to be flashy because they had to keep up with Magic. It was Ali Frazier. I seen Michigan State play the Russians on cable TV. A lot of my teammates were over at um, my apartment watching the game. And after we watched, I don't know, more than half the game, I said, Michigan State's the best team in the country. They're going to win it all this year. So that sets the stage. You should be ready for tip-off now. NBC's team of Dick Enberg, Billy Packer, and Al McGuire have the call. Remember as you watch this, in 1979, no shot clock, no three-point baskets, no possession arrow. It's the 1979 NCAA title game between the Spartans and Sycamores here on Classic Big Ticket. Our practice wasn't over yet. And Larry Bird and them just walk into our practice. We still got about 10 minutes. Cowboy hats on. Now we the city kids, and here they come the country kids. And we were like, Joe was like, we still got, damn it, we still got 10 minutes. Get out of here. And uh, there he was, the big blind bomber. <laughs> That's my first time I got a chance to really, okay, there's Larry Bird, okay. Mm hmm. That was Magic Johnson recalling his first encounter with Larry Bird as Indiana State tried to muscle in on the Spartans' practice time before this final. Let's get back to the 1979 NCAA title game, Magic versus Bird, here on Classic Big Ticket. So it's the Spartans in command during the opening half. They would close out with a 37-28 lead. I'm Gary Miller, joined again by the coaches from this historic showdown, Judd Heathcote and Bill Hodges. Judd, a big part of your success during this game was that defense against Larry Bird. He had shot 53% during the tournament throughout most of the season, but just 33% in this game, four of 11 in the first half, five air balls. How were you able to hold him in check? We had a, a matchup zone, as you know, Gary, and. And we'd put a man and a half on Larry, and every time he put the ball on the floor, why, uh, then we'd put two men on him. And, uh, you know, whenever you take something away, you give something up. So they had a lot of free looks at the basket from other players. But uh, we were going to stop Bird come hell or high water. And we did a pretty good job. Well, Bill, Larry, you could see it occasionally during the broadcast, playing with a broken thumb. They only let him put a little bit on that hand. It was his non-shooting hand. But it was an injury aggravated by an overzealous fan who grabbed him during a celebration in that victory over Arkansas. Here's what he was quoted as saying. As we were leaving the floor, this fan grabbed my left hand and started twisting it. I dropped him with a punch. I had got to a point that it didn't bother me. Now it had started hurting again. I can still handle the ball and shoot it. I intend to stick it out. How did you adjust or adapt to that? How big a factor was it, Bill? Well, you know, it affected his catching the ball more than it did anything else. And uh, when he put the ball on the floor going left, 
he was really dangerous. And it, it kind of kept him from doing that a little bit, but I don't think it really had a profound effect. I mean, it didn't bother him in the DePaul game, and he had it hurt in the DePaul game. I think it was more their defense. I want to interject that that guy at the Arkansas game was a Spartan graduate, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> now you're up nine at the break against an undefeated team, Wink, number one in the country. What went on in the locker room at halftime? Well, we just kind of talked about what we had done. If you remember, we played the last three and a half minutes with Magic on the bench with three fouls. We thought we were in control. The key thing, you know, the first half is we, we just knew we had to quit making turnovers and we knew if we were going to get back in the game, we were going to have to press them. And we weren't sure we could do that, but, uh, you know, as it turned out, you know, they were pretty susceptible to the press and maybe we should have pressed them earlier. But we didn't feel like we had the depth to do that for a whole game, and I, I doubt that we would have. I'll tell you, their offensive execution, they just made baskets that, you know, uh, I watch film, I say, gee, I never, I can't believe they made those shots. Uh, but uh, they were really good, and uh, you've got to give them credit for being that good. You know, I want to take uh, the viewers back to a little background. Both of you guys had a little difficult time getting these superstars to your school. Judd, let's talk about you first. I mean, Magic was just ticketed to come to Michigan State. He was right in Lansing. Gus Kanakis had him all committed there, and then he gets fired when he's a senior at Lansing High. How did you get him talked into coming? Because he saw you screaming. He said, I don't know if I want to play for that guy. Well, who said that? <laughs> <laughs> he did. No, I, 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 no, it was tough because uh, suddenly, uh, you know, I always say that uh, Magic's heart was at Michigan State and maybe his mind was down at Michigan. You know, he's going to make a decision. He's got a press conference scheduled for Friday. I'm supposed to sit down with he, his dad, and Dr. Tucker, his advisor, on Tuesday. I go to the meeting place and no one is there. I'm hot, you know, hey, it may go to Michigan, but you know, how come I get stiffed at the meeting? Then, you know, we have the meeting and I convince Magic at that time and his dad and Dr. Tucker that he's not gonna play center like Michigan keeps telling him he's gonna have to do because he'll be the tallest player on our team. That he's probably gonna play forward on defense for his rebounding ability, and he's going to be the point guard on offense. He's going to do some things for Michigan State that have never been done before. And we said the right things that he wanted to hear, that he already believed, and he signed the next morning on a Thursday. And then after that Friday, we had a we signed magic party at my house. I didn't have a great big mansion like the coaches have now. We had over 300 people uh, go through there. The last one left at four o'clock. I was still up. It was a great happening, and we were very, very lucky that he chose Michigan State rather than Michigan. Bill, tell us a story about going down to French Lick. You knew how great this kid was. He was an all-state high school player in Indiana, but he left IU. He was playing amateur ball. You go to his house, and his mom, Georgia Bird, says, look, he doesn't want to go to school. Why don't you just leave him alone? What made you persist and say, I'm going to talk this guy into playing for Indiana State? Well, Georgia not only did that, she slammed the door in my face. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we were driving around town talking with his uh, high school coach. He said, you know, Larry needs to go to school. He needs school. He needs to mature socially uh, before he takes a chance at the pros. Because he was talking about taking a shot at uh, going to play for Indiana Pacers. And uh, so we stayed right after him and kind of caught up with him. We were driving around town and saw this big blonde kid. I said, that can only be one <laughs> kid that big in town. And he was carrying a load of laundry out of the laundromat for his grandmother. And uh, so she invited us up for tea and uh, we sat down and, and drank some iced tea and talked to Larry about going to school. And when we left, uh, uh, you know, he, he said, well, he said, I don't think I want to go, but I've got a, a good friend that if he had gone to school, he'd really be something. And I looked at Larry and said, Larry, they're going to say that about you someday if you don't come on and go to school. And uh, so that's, that's how he ended up up there. And I'm just glad he played as well as he did and made us all famous for a long time. Well, folks, now you know how history was made there in East Lansing and Terre Haute. It's the second half coming up of this 1979 NCAA championship game. Our two coaches have given us a little bit of a preview. We'll get to it between the Spartans and the Sycamores here on Classic Big Ticket. We were both the same. He was poor, I was poor. 
His family didn't have a lot. I, my family didn't have a lot. Um, his mother was strong. My mother's strong. Um, so it, it was, it, and we both come from small towns, you know, Lansing, French Lick. So it was just so much we had that we shared with one another that was similar to one another. Again, now we still li link to each other years and years later, and we will always be. So the Sycamores have closed the lead down to single digits as we continue our classic big ticket, Indiana State against Michigan State, the 1979 NCAA title game, Magic versus Bird. Bill, one of the reasons you got so close, Kelser's out of the game with four fouls. How'd you take advantage with him on the bench? Well, we started pressing and, and speeding the game up, and we loosened up. We started taking shots and making shots uh, that we normally made. I, you know, I, we started out the game pretty tight, and uh, we ended up with a smaller lineup so we could press, which put Larry down inside, and I think that helped us a good deal. I want to talk to each of you guys and get your impressions of the other guy's superstar. Obviously, you had seen each other in the Final Four. Give me your impression when you saw Bird and played against him, what it was like, his intensity, what your impressions were. Well, you had a, a superstar that uh, was still a team player. And we knew that uh, there were a lot of different ways that Bird could help his team win or win it all by himself. And uh, that didn't change watching. Uh, the only thing that I thought of for about 10 minutes was when do we put Gregory back in? When do we put Gregory back in? And coaches were saying, hey, we better get Gregory back in there. And I said, nah, we better wait a little longer because if he gets his fifth foul, uh, we've got nothing down the stretch. And so, hey, when they cut it to six, we had to put him back in. And as Bill said, hey, they started hitting some outside shots. Those would have been three-point shots in today's game. So, uh, and yet I still believe when we had our uh, two superstars in there, we were a much, much better team than Indiana State with their one superstar, and I'll believe that till I die, uh, maybe next week sometime. Uh, we hope Judd will stay with us for a lot longer. Uh, I thought Magic was a great player, but I thought his biggest contribution to them was passing to Kelser. As it turned out, he just shot the ball right in our face, took it inside on us, and did things I didn't expect him to do. He rebounded over the top of us. We had out-rebounded everybody we played, and they just dominated us on the boards. So Magic, uh, he surprised us. I, I, think, I don't think any of us thought he could score like he did against us. Must have been from playing bird in practice. He got some notions in his head. <laughs> okay, guys, thanks. And we return, will the Spartans pull away in this title game, or will Larry Bird and his gritty bunch continue to claw their way back? Stick around as the 1979 NCAA title game continues right after this. For myself and Larry to play in that championship game and bring passing back, and still be the number one rated NCAA Finals is saying a whole lot. I knew right away we was in for a tough game. They had a lot of talent. They had guys that were playing very well. Uh, I knew it was going to be a dogfight. I really felt we had a good opportunity to win the game. We made a comeback, and I, I thought we started picking up the tempo a little bit. But uh, the left-handed guard, uh, Donnelly, just absolutely murdered us, hit like four shots in a row when we was playing at our best and we couldn't catch him then. Magic Johnson and Larry Bird reminiscing about this historic title game for ESPN Classic. As Larry said, unsung hero Terry Donnelly made the Sycamores pay. We now move ahead to further action in the second half. Carl Nix has fouled out for the Sycamores and Michael Berkovich is at the charity stripe for the Spartans with his team up seven here on Classic Big Ticket. Michigan State captures its first NCAA National Basketball Championship, 75-64. I'm Gary Miller, joined once again by Judd Heathcote and Bill Hodges. Judd, we talked about the two great superstars, Magic and Greg Kelser, but where would you have been without Terry Donnelly, a guy who said, hey, I didn't expect them to give me the ball and get to shoot, and yet he couldn't miss in that game. How did that happen? Well, he goes five for five, and believe it or not, in the pregame, I told Mike Bergovich and Terry Donnelly, hey, they're going to put great pressure on the other guys. You guys might be wide open. When you are, you have to take the shot. If we 
miss it, hey, we'll try to get the rebound. And Mike Berkovich would not shoot. <laughs> and, but Terry Donnelly did. He hit uh, five for five in the game, and he had four jump shots in the second half that actually probably uh, uh, was the uh, reason that we won. After the game, you said about him, Bill, when you play as hard and intensely as Larry does, you have to have emotion. For Larry, it just wasn't the end of a game. It was the end of a career. He shot seven for 21 in that game. When was the first time you spoke to him? When we got back in the locker room, and I think the key thing I said to the kids uh, was, you know, we had a great, great season. If we'd have started the season with being picked number four in the conference, and I would told you all that uh, we could get to the national championship, but we couldn't win it, would you have accepted that? And of course, they all nodded yes. They would have accepted that, but once they got there, that wasn't enough. And that wasn't enough for Larry. He felt like he had let us down. Judd, let's say it goes differently, and Indiana State finishes 34-0. They win that game. Does Magic come back for another shot at the title, or does he still go to the pros? How would life might have been different for you? No, I think he goes to the pros because of the situation. You know, everyone says that Magic visited Los Angeles, met some movie stars, met uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and all that, got starstruck. Only one thing happened. They brought him in the room and said, hey, you remember Oscar Robertson? Yeah, great, great player. How many championships did he win? One. When uh, at the end of his career, he was able to play with Kareem in Milwaukee. Right. He said, you can have a great career but you'll be drafted by the poorest club. You may never win a championship. We have the unique situation. We have a great club, the number one draft pick. We're gonna take you. You come in and play on a winner. That's what he wanted to hear. Winning was so important to Magic. All the rest was not. He would have gone regardless of whether we won or lost. All right, let's do a little revisionist history here. Bill Judd had said that you had told him some years after this game that that loss actually ruined your life. You only coached there three more seasons. You were quoted as saying, I should have left when Larry left. How did that affect you? I mean, was Those it a blessing were jokes, or a curse? Gary, those were jokes. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> was it a blessing or a curse to have played in and lost that game? It may have been a curse in, in some ways. I don't think it ruined my life. It sure did set me back because I uh, was never able to attain uh, what we had attained my first year in coaching. Uh, I wasn't fortunate enough to get the, you know, the players to do that. And when I left Indiana State, uh, I was never able to get a job that I could really get back to the NCAA. I came awfully close a couple times. But you know, uh, I wouldn't say it ruined my life. I have a wonderful life. Uh, you know, I work at uh, a middle school teaching geography to kids. I love coming to work every day. I'll tell you what though, fame is fleeting. Don't expect to stay famous forever. You can be infamous, though, and that'll stay with you forever. Judge, you talked about how you had a sense, and it never got reported, of what was going to happen in the future. Do you guys have any inkling? I mean, can you put into perspective, a quarter of a century later, we still talk about this game and all the great championships that have happened in between in the NCAAs, but this one still is unique. It's special. Can you put it into focus for us? Well, I think it's special because the two players that uh, were key to the two teams, I think consensus opinion is they saved pro basketball. Uh, the rivalry between uh, Los Angeles and Boston, the success that Larry Bird had, that Magic Johnson had, has, uh, I think, catapulted the pro game to where it is today. You can give credit to Michael Jordan and uh, uh, Kareem and others, but it was Magic and Bird that saved pro basketball. And I think that's why so much focus is placed back on this game. How about you reflecting, Bill? You know, it's one of those things that uh, it changed our coaches association so much because everybody started going to the Final Four. And, uh, you know, when we had the, the coaches dinner where the four coaches at the Final Four spoke, there was about 200 people there. Now there's about 2,000. <laughs> yeah, it's just gotten huge. And I think the uh, media and, and television has done a lot of that. Uh, it may be oversaturation a little bit, but uh, I still really enjoy basketball. But coaching finally wore me out, and uh, I had to find another career.
Well, guys, it's been great reminiscing with you. If you hadn't talked those two kids into coming to your schools, who knows what would have happened to college and pro basketball. Thanks for reliving the 1979 NCAA championship with us here on Classic Big Ticket. One final note, Magic and Larry would combine for eight NBA championships in the 1980s, pitted against each other in the finals. Magic Lakers held a two-to-one edge over Larry Celtics. For Classic Big Ticket, I'm Gary Miller.